Hi, I'm Jim Clark, Visual Arts Manager here at Hopkins Center for the Arts. I'm speaking with Joshua Bindewald about his exhibition, Muchness, on view in the Upper Lobby Gallery through at January 7th, 2023. Josh, welcome. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Can you tell us a bit about uh, the inspiration for this body of work? Yes, this body of work actually spans um, what seems like quite a bit of time, but uh, when you look at it in the context of, you know, a, a visual artist who also has a full-time day job, seven years really isn't that long to, to come up with 20 pieces. You know, I, uh, it's kind of a corollary here, but I, I find myself still 10 plus years later pining for the days of graduate school when all that was expected of me was to work in the studio. You know, in that situation, you could have an idea and work on it and resolve things much more quickly. The reality of life now is that um, something like this piece, for example, is gonna be floating around for literally years before you ultimately revisit it and figure out how you want to uh, wrap it up. And the inspiration is, is kind of everything. Um, I've thought a lot about this because as artists, you know, one thing that you need to do, especially if you're trying to exhibit the work, is you have to be able to talk about it. You have to be able to explain it to someone who has never seen it before. People, they always want that added context. And it's, a, it's frankly a struggle. I think most artists would agree with me on that. But to actually answer the question what the inspiration is, um, it's kind of alluded to in the title of the exhibition, and it truly is everything. I, I kind of think... I visualize myself as, as sort of like a funnel. You know, everything I, I hear, I see, I smell, I feel, I experience, it's all kind of like all of those things, all of those stimuli coming through me. And then as an artist, the way that I kind of react, that, that uh, not to be too grandiose, but it's a catharsis, right? It's the way I express myself. It's kind of like a, a compulsion when I, I have these feelings, these things that I want to respond to, that's how I do it. I'm not a songwriter. It's, it's, it's what I do. So um, pieces like actually these two right here, if you want a specific, they're primarily about changing landscape. You know, I, I work in uh, the uptown neighborhood of Minneapolis and I've been there for about 10 years and it's constant, you know, tear down, new six-story structure that is mixed use, you know, retail and living. So it's, it's like me just kind of absorbing that and uh, particularly in these two pieces, finding a way to respond to it. They're not straight up representational. You know, you're not gonna look at those and be like, oh yeah, that's a, a condominium building on, on Lake and Grand or something like that. Um, but that's just simply because it's not the way I work. Um, my visual vocabulary is, is generally not straight up representational. There might be vestiges of representational or, or recognizable things, but mostly it's abstraction, um, trying to get the, the essence, break it down into what I think are meaningful and interesting, like compositional elements. Um, so the inspiration, <laughs> this long answer for a pretty simple question, but the inspiration is really everything. I respond to my experience, my feelings, the things that I see, the things that I hear. Um, and one more thing that I'll add about that is while it may not immediately be apparent that there's any sort of critique happening within this work, um, it definitely is. And that's where that catharsis is for me as an artist. Um, it's in my artist statement too, but it's, it's a little less important to me on the surface, whether the viewer looks at something and understands that that may be a critique of, of this system in our contemporary world or, or that system. Um, for me, my primary goal as an artist is to like kind of engage the viewer. I really want them to, to have a moment, hopefully a, a prolonged moment of, for lack of a better word, pleasure, right? I'm trying to make things that people enjoy looking at. The inspiration for those, though, is, is my need to respond in some way to what is 
not nonstop, you know, absorption of information. I'm a uh, uh, ADD diagnosed adult, and this is one way I, I make sense of the world. Josh, you mentioned uh, like a songwriter as uh, an analogy. If, if you were a songwriter and these were your songs, what genre would you oh, say? Oh man, <laughs> you, you know, actually that's a great question. I, and I think it would be, there'd be an album that's like alt country. There'd probably be an album that's electronic Strictly, there'd be an album that might even be like uh, uh, more folk, like mm -hmm. maybe some bluegrass. Um, I do like hip hop, but I, I don't think I'd, I'd give a go at rap if yeah. we're using that analogy. <laughs> but uh, I, I mean, that's, that's actually a really good question. My music taste is extremely eclectic. Um, and actually, you know, I think the, the visual art that I make, uh, it's, that's something that has, has been a bit of a struggle too when we're talking about trying to solicit oneself as an artist is I kind of, I, I follow the, the inspiration and the, the desire to make what I want as it leads me. And sometimes it doesn't result in the most like linearly cohesive body of work, but you know, I try my best to argue. And I think if you look at it long enough, you'll definitely see common threads. Uh, however, I would say if I were an actual songwriter, I'd probably be making uh, either individual songs that like very widely, I'm sure the record company would be like, no, 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 no. <laughs> you got to kind of rein it in here so we know how to market this. But uh, I think it would probably be, you know, if we, if we consider, to use that analogy, each piece a different album, mm -hmm. then I'd, I'd be kind of all over the place. We do live in a time where um, an emphasis is put on that uh, cohesion a, a certain, um, and I think it's market driven. Yeah, how, how, I think it is. How, how does a gallerist market your work? How does an artist in this age of uh, social media and the ability to self market, how do you present a, a, that kind of monolithic brand, mm -hmm. um, which can put artists that have wide ranging interests and a maximal uh, uh, conceptual and aesthetic um, mindset at a little bit of a disadvantage. But I feel like while your works are quite disparate um, and, um, and much, that there is a, a, a unifying visual vocabulary. I mean, you can see, but it does require the viewer spending some time, mm -hmm. spending some time. Um, how did you develop this visual vocabulary? Was it something, have there been elements of color or form, um, shape that have been present since when did you arrive at this? I don't imagine overnight. So have, how far back could you see elements of this aesthetic? I would say uh, as far back as uh, undergraduate, which would have mm -hmm. been, I graduated in 2004. Um, I was a, definitely a late bloomer, not the most mature young adult. Um, like to consider myself a slow learner. Um, so I hit my stride pretty late mm -hmm. um, compared to my peers when I was in college, but it was in a, uh, there's a particularly memorable moment was in a, a, win a winter or J term class, you know, during winter break, it was like a two week intensive class that um, I really just embraced mark making and color interaction and playing with that. And uh, during that class, I ultimately made um, five pieces, which I mean, to this day, like almost 20 years later, I still regard as being pretty worthwhile in my, you know, entirety of my production. And, you know, that time kind of helped me to become confident in color. Uh, I kind of, 
went in just through caution to the wind and the results were good. So at that point, I, I don't think I ever questioned it again. I was having a conversation with you last week about how I actually find it more difficult to work in black and white. I think um, uh, you can hide maybe things that are of a, a little bit lesser quality with like color because color is so attention getting. Whereas if you're going to develop a strong image with minimal color, um, you have you have less that you can kind of lean on to prop you up. But I, my answers are so meandering. I apologize for this. Uh, no, back, no need to circle back a little bit more to like how my vocabulary developed. It has been an ongoing thing mm -hmm. um, in that, you know, late undergraduate school mark making became what I was about. I was struggling to figure out how I was going to say what I wanted to say. Um, you know, I, I was a good drawer, but I wasn't the best drawer. I never had the ability like some of my peers to just imagine something and draw it. Um, and I, st I still can't. I have to work if I want to do something representational. I basically have to be working from life or from an image. And that wasn't very fun for me. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that took, took the like spontaneity and the desire to work on it. If I was for me personally, you know, some people are, are very good at that and enjoy that. But ultimately, it needs to be fun, right? Especially now when it's, you know, it's, uh, it's not my, my profession is is in the arts, but I'm not supporting myself with the art that I make. So it better be fun. Otherwise, <laughs> you know, what, what am I, what am I doing it for? So the vocabulary has, has been an ongoing thing. You can see things that I've um, kind of gravitated toward is th that are very much a part of, of me now, which remain from way back then. And that would be color, of course. And then back to the, like just the straight up gesture and mark making, there's a very recent piece, um, a lithograph right over there that is like a total throwback to that uh, uh, 20 years ago, experimenting with just making marks and seeing how I could layer them and, and ultimately create what I hope is an engaging image. Um, there is in graduate school, you know, in graduate school, you, I, had been, I took a break. I had like four years or five years off between undergrad and graduate school. I was just working jobs, continuing my artistic practice on the side. Um, so for that period, there was like sort of a lack of critical dialogue um, that you would have when you're a student. You know, you didn't have regular critiques or, you know, the, the studio engagements with your peers. So then when I got back into school after that period of time, you know, graduate school is very heavy on that, like the how, what, why of what you're doing. So you had to, you had to really dive in and see, okay, why am I making what I'm making and what does all this mean? And um, environment is hugely important to me. Um, you know, when we go back to that funnel analogy I was using earlier, like I'm a visual person, so I see what's happening. If it's, you know, the abundance of trash on the street on a Monday morning or, you know, those buildings going up. But conversely, if I'm just in the woods where I can hardly see a trace of, of human interaction, you know, I'm definitely absorbing that too. So in graduate school, I kind of figured out environment and, and land and our interaction with it and subjugation of it is kind of, is kind of probably what I'm mostly interested in responding to because it's what I'm mostly noticing. It's what burdens me the most when I think about the state of the world. It all, you know, any really any pet issue or problem you can think of that we're confronting as as human beings in the 21st century. I mean, it all kind of comes back to our planet in, in one way or another. Right. So that's kind of my um, driving force and has definitely informed my vocabulary uh, very strongly since I would say 2008. Josh, um, you describe what you do. I mean, the title says it, muchness, but they're, they're maximal images, mm -hmm. um, really the opposite of minimal. They're, they're 
they're fully stuffed. I won't say overstuffed because sometimes. that sounds like a judgment, but sometimes I mean, they are. <laughs> um, were you always making images like this? And did you discover, if so, did you discover what they meant from um, a content or, or the, the, the cognitive thematic element of it? Did you come to recognize that through discussions in grad school or with other artists? Or did you recognize, realize that that was what you were doing all along? I mean, maybe a, a more succinct way. Look, I'm meandering too. <laughs> maybe a more succinct way uh, to, to put it was, um, were these images occurring, they, you were making them, and then you discovered what they meant, or did you go about it more strategically? You, you identified, this is what my content is, what will this look like? I would Does say the former. Yeah. And that's actually a very perceptive question. Um, the first part of your, your question about like whether or not I learned what this was about through discussions with peers and, and faculty and stuff, um, probably a little bit, but no, mostly through discovery. Mm -hmm. um, I had, I had a, good, a good response to that first part of your question and I've kind of lost it now. So hopefully just explaining it will get us back there. It, it is the, the muchness part, I think I realized just through making that, oh yeah, that makes sense. Like I'm so scatterbrained. I have so many things going on in my head at any one time, so many things that are interesting to me, so many marks that I want to make, so many things that I find visually appealing that I want to respond to from, from my experiences that like I have to pour it all on. And um, I have more or less learned to embrace it. it. And it was mostly a process of, of discovery. I don't want to take or apply too much credit to myself the conversations were on everything as they should have been, but it was, I think, self-discovery. I, I think it wasn't until towards the end of grad school and since that I've been able to kind of marry it all and, and unapologetically be like, yeah, these are often over the top. Sometimes they are overworked and that sucks. Um, it, 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 it is a, it's a difficult thing for somebody who, who, you know, it works representational to necessarily know when something's done, but I would argue it's at least as difficult to know when you're not working representationally because there is no make this look like that sort of a thing. So it, it can be a, a struggle. But it, it brings up another, uh, when, when you're not working representationally as you are, um, though there are, like Larry Rivers called it a smorgasbord of the recognizable. And, and there are, I mean, there's a Larry couple Rivers of legs made a here. Lot of and there's some, what's that? Larry Rivers made a lot of prints. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And there's some, there's some legs here and some trees there, but for the most part, non-representational, non-objective. What, what are the things that you look for that signal this work is complete? How do you know? What's a Honestly, what I usually do now is I'll take, when I'm working on something, I take, uh, when I'm stepping away, I'll take a photograph on my phone and then I go sit and stare at it. And you know, that, that smaller version of the image um, really helps me to look at like, is this a dynamic composition? Um, are there moments of rest? Are there moments where uh, the viewer is gonna be led through um, to, to be really engaged and that's where I start is from like, you know, those when I step away for a moment, I'm kind of scrutinizing it in a different way on a much smaller format. And, and I almost always see things differently on that little LED screen than I do when I'm, I'm taking it in person. And from there, I'll just go, you know, usually stand and stare at it for a while in person. And my favorite part is actually those like finishing touches. When you're like, this is, this is almost done. What am I, what am I going to do? And in order to actually do that, once in a while, depending on what type of print it is, I might even 
take that photograph into Photoshop and like, you know, add a, a color or a gesture, some, something somewhere that I'm considering. Um, if the medium, if it's, it's something collage that I'm considering, you can just lay it on top, right? And kind of uh, see how it's gonna work. Uh, there, there is no formula other than uh, I'm gonna scrutinize it on my little LED screen and that's usually going to reveal to me whether it's close to being finished and successful or if it needs a lot of work. If it needs a lot of work, then I'll make little, um, the iPhone now has, you know, the little pen tool. It's not, it's not very accurate, but mm -hmm. you know, if I'm looking at it on like my lunch break and I see something, I can make a little mark that I can come back to um, and then just kind of, uh, you know, suffer over it until I, I feel like it is done. Sure. And do you think the, the, um, that process of taking a photograph and shrinking it, um, I mean, it's like the aerial view, right? It's like the mm -hmm. view from 10,000 feet above. So you're seeing it in a holistic sense. And, and that, is it that aspect that helps you, do you think? Yes, or, yeah. I do. I do. I, to, you hit the nail on the head. It's a holistic sense. Um, and that's, that, I mean, that's how most people are probably viewing my work too. So it's, it's helpful in that regard. Like I need to, you might think of it as I need to really, I, I need to set the hook on that digital image in order to make someone want to come look at it in person. Um, so yeah, I think that holistic 10,000 foot view is really what solidifies it as being in progress, complete or near completion. Mm -hmm. With such dense images, um, I think uh, a viewer off the street would um, be uh, amazed and, and wonder how in the world would one even start such a dense image? So process wise, do you have an idea in mind to begin or do you work stuff out with rough thumbnails or how, can you walk us through sure. if you even have a main process? This is and, the, the easiest question for me to answer. And the answer is I do minimal pre-work like across the board almost always the, the pre-work, the conceptualization before actually beginning the piece is minimal. The first reason that is, I learned this many years ago, um, even I think in high school, you know, in a class you're expected to keep a sketchbook. And, you know, maybe it's my scatter, scatterbrained thing, but I, I just, I found very little satisfaction in working on on something that is essentially just an image that only I'm going to see that is one of many. And many years later, I, that kind of was only reinforced by me being like, I don't want to put in the two hours or one hour or two hours plus on this pre-drawing only to do it again bigger or whatever it may be on a canvas or on a lithographic stone. So. It wasn't, it wasn't to my benefit in a class like life drawing when I was in um, undergrad. And, you know, like a big part of, of the coursework was to do these drawings that were basically just your sketches. And I loathed, loathed that. I was like this, you know, I understand that it's, it's good for like honing your abilities as a drawer, but I, I don't mean to, to, to sound disparag disparaging to anyone else, but to, for me personally, it feels like that's wasted time. Like that energy that I have to work on something, that excitement, like the last thing I want to do is pour any of that into a sketch because, you know, the well is only so full. And if I deplete it some working on the sketch, ultimately the final work for me suffers. So the pre-work is minimal. There are definitely ideas and ideation when I have a good idea. It generally is just um, my sketchbook is filled with like rectangles with a few lines and then text. And the, and the idea is usually very simple. Like I'll have an idea that I know I know I want the primary aspect of this composition to be, uh, you know, like this 
this vertical thrust of something and I want to do this work around it. And that's where I'll start. And then the, the best part of working for me, what I enjoy far and away the most is the intuitive kind of spontaneity of just composing on the spot. In uh, the text that you write, is it primarily visual cues? Yes. I mean, just to clarify, like the idea is a visual idea, mm -hmm. a verbal. It's it's not it's not it's not um, content or theme, but rather an aesthetic idea that then you dig into and you figure out what it is as Almost it goes. Always, yeah. yeah. And even the the visual idea. Um, I, off, I usually don't even need to note what content or context that is coming from what I'm responding to. You know, if yeah. it's a, if I'm like, want to somehow respond to like a, a social injustice or something, usually just by like writing visually how mm -hmm. I'm going to start that, I don't need to note to myself where it's coming from as far as like my response to the, sure. the world, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, the notes are almost always like visual cues. Going back a, a little bit to to content and the discovery of content, do you feel a need to justify the existence of the work through content? Yeah, yeah, I, I do. Um, that's that's another great question. Not as much anymore. You sound surprised. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, I'm, I'm, not, not, I'm sure. not surprised. It is it is genuinely a good question. Not as much anymore. Um, that was one of the, probably the most important thing I learned in graduate school um, was the ability to justify and also to just be able to say, that's why I did it. And, you know, if you like it or not, whatever. Right. Um, Cause you know, you'd be peppered with these like uh, kind of barbed questions about what you're doing. And you've, and maybe they were trying to do this. I don't know. They never told me, my advisors never told me this was exactly the goal. But for me, what was meaningful was just to be like, I, I'm con I know why I did it. And I'm confident that I can tell you why I did it. Um, if, if that's even important uh, to your enjoyment of the work and whether that's good enough for you as a faculty member is, uh, or a, a viewer, is beside the point. Like I, I, I am trained in this. I have explored it enough and am confident enough in my abilities. So, um, you know, that's all there. The next step is whether or not the viewer enjoys it and, and sees that. And that's something I, I can't control. Mm -hmm. So, Hopefully that answers your question. I th absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there, as you you speak of it, there's um, some heavier content in how it relates to uh, human nature, um, waste, but there's humor as well. I mean, I very overt humor in some yeah. of the pieces, mm -hmm. and some are just. Uh, maybe a gentler humor. Um, is it important to you that there is some humor for, for, for levity or, or is it important for you that the viewer maybe smiles to themselves while, while look, enjoying the work? Absolutely. If yeah. in those instances of overt humor, yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I, I would love it if they, you know, smile or chuckle or, or, you know, w walk away thinking that it was a uh, humorous moment. And there's definitely a touch of whimsy in pretty much all of the work, even if through nothing else, just through the color. So yes, there is very heavy subject matter often, but, you know, to use the old analogy of like hitting someone over the head with a message, that's the last thing I want to do mm -hmm. is like um, burden the viewer with more bad news, right? These are ultimately decorations that should bring some, hopefully some moment of pleasure to the person looking at it. Uh, you know, and it's, it's a form of escapism. Hopefully you get lost just as you would get lost in a song or lost in a, you know, a moving picture. Hopefully you get lost in looking at these for a while. 
so yeah, humor, humor is definitely um, an element. I, I like to think of myself as a very funny person anyway, <laughs> or at least, you know, I, I, I appreciate humor quite a bit. It's a big part of my life. Maybe all art is at some level a self portrait of the artist, but um, you're wearing, is that houndstooth? Yeah. Houndstooth. Houndstooth shows up as a visual texture in at least one of the works. Mm -hmm. Is, do you see your work as a whole as very uh, self-portrait-ish or is there, if not, is there one that is maybe the closest to that in this show? I would argue that pretty much all art is autobiographical in some sense, right? Um, because no matter how you're working, you're ultimately filtering, again, to use that word stimuli, whatever's in your, in your mind, whatever's driving you to create, it's coming through you. So it's, it's, it's being filtered through your lived experience. Um, so again, I would argue that, that there's an element of autobiography in all artists' work. But in this show, yes, there are some that are extremely autobiographical. The first piece, all the way at the end, I mean, it says essential Bindewald <laughs> on it, which um, I, probably no one gets this. I was talking with some people at the opening and mentioned this, but uh, it's not that I'm an egotist, but I did, you know, I, I, I ran across a song in like a playlist that was a Barbara Streisand song, and it was off an album called Essential Streisand. And I thought that was kind of like, frankly, pretty, e I, I'm, Barbara may not have titled it, but I mean, that's kind, of ego, that's kind of egotistical to call something like essential Streisand. Are you knocking Babs? <laughs> no, no, no. I, hey, I, I downloaded the song and I, and I absolutely love it. No, I'm absolutely not. And that's market driven, right? But I th that was kind of the impetus for, I had been, had all these ideas for a self-portrait anyway. And when I saw that, I was like, well, that's where I'm gonna start. Um, so that is definitely a self-portrait. And then the piece with the houndstooth, which is called Tenure, um, it's actually a series, it's state two of that series, and it's an ongoing series. Um, that is, a, was a P, uh, series that was started 10 years after I graduated. Um, and Tenure, I mean, it's a play on words. Not only has it been 10 years, but I also, if you would have asked me back then where I th what I thought I'd be doing in 10 years, I thought hopefully I'd be a tenured professor somewhere because at the time I, uh, my primary goal was to be teaching art somewhere. And the pattern, the houndstooth, I mean, you'll see pattern, not necessarily houndstooth, but geometric or pattern or repeating things in images throughout. And I like to argue that that's kind of my way of like, that's like a crutch. That's my way of like making sense, something I can, can lean on. Again, my brain is, is, is often so scattered that I kind of like seek pattern. I seek uniformity in some ways. Um, and I recognize that. And as such, I, I, I do enjoy like bringing that into the art, not only because, you know, longstanding patterns like houndstooth, they're, they're beautiful, right? I, I mean, they wouldn't be a part of, of fashion for as long as they are, were it not for that fact that they're visually appealing. So I like to capitalize on that for sure. And it's interesting that you say for you, it's a bit of a, a, a crutch. Uh, I, for the viewer, it's, it's something that they can grab onto mm -hmm. too, because they recognize that. Yeah. Oh, I've got a blazer with that or whatever. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's got that, mm, familiarity that they can grab onto in an image that's ripe with more challenging elements. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's like a, a, a normalcy somewhere they can like, yeah, as you said, grab on amidst everything else that's going on and then they can kind of wander throughout, particularly in the piece that we're referencing with the houndstooth, I, I, I view it as that way. Cool. We should open it up to some questions from our lovely studio audience. Mostly lovely. <laughs> They're all, lo all lovely. So you've talked about gesture, you've talked about your inspiration. I'm always curious, when you face a blank piece of paper, 
Are you doing gestures to define what it is? How do you determine where the edge of what the image is going to be? And then how you populate it into the inside? Or do you look at the experience that you want to evoke? And it's a process of how the viewer or yourself being the original viewer is going to move through the passage until you get to that point where you're putting the final touches on that you were talking about. This is uh, actually a pretty good lead into, I can tell you why I, I uh, kind of came into printmaking. Um, what's worse than a, a blank sheet of paper, a blank canvas, right? You, have you heard the term horror vacui? It means fear of empty space. And I think many artists suffer with that. Like it's overwhelming to look at something that hasn't begun at all. Um, and you know, when I was in school, I, I struggled with that immensely, especially when you got to the little bit more advanced projects or advanced level classes where it was up to you. You weren't so much going on an assignment. You were just more expected to invent something anew. And with printmaking, to use a $10 word um, that we use in printmaking, the matrix. The matrix is the term for what your image comes from. A matrix is a wood block. A matrix could be a copper plate that you've done an intaglio print on. A matrix is a lithographic stone. Whatever, whatever printmaking technique you're doing, the matrix is ultimately what you make the image on that then offsets it onto the paper. So what printmaking did for me was, you know, I'm not looking at the final product when I start working on that matrix, that wood block or that copper plate. I'm just working on it. The final product is going to be what offsets onto the paper when I run it through the press. So for me, that was like completely freeing. For one thing, the matrix is almost never white, you know, bright white, which is like the most absent of anything, right? So it, it just freed me to be less intimidated and less constrained. So I could just start working on the matrix knowing that a mistake here, while it's gonna show up in the print, can be edited here before I ultimately make the print that's the final. So fast forward many, many years, that um, working in, in printmaking and having what I refer to as the buffer. You know, you've got the, the act of offsetting the image from the matrix onto the paper was always that beautiful buffer that removed the intimidation from beginning the image. And I think that really enabled me to now confront a piece of white paper or a, a blank panel, whatever it may be, and just go to town. But, you know, when confronted with, uh, uh, um, if I am truly working on, you know, uh, something that is starting from a white piece of paper or a panel, which means it's not starting as a print off of a matrix, um, the way I would begin is, the first thing I have to do is get rid, I, I, there needs to be something on that, that bright, white, completely absent, vacant thing. And there's a lot of ways to do that. Um, trying to think of most recently, yeah, so a painting that's in this show, back to like the earlier conversations about, you know, waste and, and land and environmental concerns. Um, and the, the frames in this show are a product of that as well. I'm very concerned about the waste generated by my own artistic practice, right? I, I mean, any, it's not specific to art, but a lot of these are petroleum based products that we're using and it generates waste. You might not use all the ink you mixed or the paint you mixed, et cetera, et cetera. So with one of the paintings in the show, what I did was I collected um, all this throwaway screen printing ink that people in my studio had been using that they didn't want anymore. You know, cause you'll end up with small amounts or colors that you're not going to use again. So I just gathered it and I was using a, a drywall taping knife to basically just spread thin layers onto a, a primed panel. Um, that's kind of a weird example, but I mean, that's one way to remove the horror vacui is just to start. And in that case, I knew, I kind of had an idea that it was both gonna be a um, reductive and additive process I was gonna carve into 
all these layers that I put on, but then I was also going to build on top of them, which also is, is uh, the, the way I do, um, particularly in my intaglio prints, are very physical in that way. And I see that as a corollary for the way that we, we interact with our, our planet. Uh, does that answer? That's a great answer. I mean, it gives yeah. some context anyway. Yeah. I like the and I like I like the additional vocabulary you've just given me because that I live in that space. Oh okay. my God, I have a blank sheet of paper now. What? <laughs> yeah, just put a mark on it. Yeah, dirty it up. And yeah, put a mark on it and then erase the mark, and then you've got something to react to. Uh, Erasure is also a mark, right? It is. I like to think of it that way. Yeah. Thank you. Mm hmm. Anyone else? So I would agree that artwork is definitely autobiographical. Like it definitely represents the experiences that you're going through. Um, and looking at your work, I see a lot of like spaces. And I'm just curious if you travel a lot and if you're kind of reacting to the visuals, the new visuals that you experience with those, with the travel. Um, and then also, you know, how much of that is coming through versus how much is coming through your emotions and your experiences? It's a good question. I, I shamefully have traveled very little in my life. I didn't get on an airplane until um, I was 21, but I've gone a few places now and my wife and I are going to be going to Italy next fall. So travel, not a lot. However, um, I am extremely observant. So when I, when I go anywhere, even if in many cases it's a place I've been a lot, I am observing much usually to the detriment of whoever I'm with because I'm not paying attention <laughs> to <laughs> what we're discussing or doing together. You know, I'm just kind of looking around and I don't know that it always makes me the best driver either, mm -hmm. knock on wood that I don't have a rich accident history. But um, I, I am absolutely, extremely observant. And um, as far as how it translates to the work, I think that's kind of what you're asking if it's experiential, um, right? You, you said, I Like the visual, like what you're reacting to visually versus, you know, the emotional component, what's coming out from your experiences with others. I think it's, it's got to be about 50-50 because there is so much of my own emotion um, imbued into the work, but it's also extremely informed by what I observe. Yeah, you can see that. Thank you. Uh, well, I, I could see where you're coming from because I, I have an art education. I have a degree in art, and I've had a teacher saying less is more. And I would always say more is more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, and I've learned to sort of meet in the middle. And, um, you know, and I see all the different medium you're putting into it. And this year I wanted to take a break from w one of the mediums I work in and just go in my studio and go crazy. So I can really relate. I love the color. And I like what you do on the bottom of your prints. I've done a bunch of prints because I had some graduate work also and how you put the colors and then incorporate it in your work. So I think it's really great. And That's a, uh, <laughs> particularly the ones you're referencing where like it's a color log yeah. mm -hmm. that was totally ripped off from an artist that oh. I <laughs> admire. But I'm, I'm no, okay in saying right. that. It was, uh, uh, I don't know if I'm gonna pronounce this correctly, but um, Hundertwasser, he was an Austrian, very eccentric guy. But when he made prints, and actually, I think it was the people that were printing the prints for him. It was more meant to be like torn off the sheet after the fact, you know, their little registration and color logs, but he kept them. And I always thought it was like, what a beautiful entry point for the viewer to like, cause his images are very maximal as well for them to like be able to isolate individual colors with, you know, even a little white space around them and then pull them out in the, in the image. But as an artist, Beside drawing from things around us, we do learn from other artists and oh, we learn course. from other teachers. And then 
bring a little of it into our work or a lot of it into mm -hmm. our work. So. Yeah, at this point, everything right. has more or less been done, right? So we're just kind of recycling. We have to bring our own personality mm -hmm. into it, which I think you do. Thank you. A great job. <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to ask about your process a little. I was very uh, impressed with you starting with something representational, which is the photo. Did you describe taking some photos? I take photos all the time. Um, and then, for instance, these two pieces here, did they start with a small photo and then you visualized from that? That was a representational thing, but you extended it to these works. These, so these actually didn't start um, from a photograph uh, and very few works in this exhibition actually began as photographs. I take a lot of photographs and I do consider them source material, things that I'm, I'm going to incorporate, but it's often not strictly representationally. A photograph may be like a uh, color inventory that I'm going to use in a piece, or it may include just like a, a primary jet, I guess. So I could say yes. Um, in the case of, of this one, there is a gesture when I say gesture, I mean like a, a mark, a movement through the piece that is based on a, on a photograph. But I'm, so I'm, you, you get inspiration from just looking at things and take, oh yeah. taking a picture of mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. And then you create these. Yeah. Yeah, that's quite interesting. Yeah, kind of like, uh, well, to use the word alchemy would imply some sort of magic and I don't want to, in any way insinuate that I'm a magician, but it is kind of like a, you take this and get this, which is something completely different, but there is like a, a ingredients. Yeah, it's through your eyes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can you share who, uh, uh, what people you in your life give you a lot of encouragement? Encouragement? Um, well, you know, I, at my workplace, I'm a High Point Center for Printmaking. I'm also a member of our studio cooperative, uh, which has approximately 70 or so artists. Um, and I do my printing there. So I have a network of people who, uh, you know, much like in, a commu in any sort of communal, array, even if it's a classroom where you're working with your peers on on similar projects. There's an immense amount of encouragement that takes place there. Um, I'll be honest, again, to my detriment, I really don't seek the feedback nearly as much as I should. Um, even when I was a student, not that I was like embarrassed or like uh, buttoned up in a critique. I just, I don't know, there's something, something about it. I, I, I I don't seek it out as much as I should. And I usually seek specific feedback out from very select people uh, for whatever reason. Is it a sense of self-assurance? Is it, is it confidence? No. Like within me? Yeah. Oh no, I, there's, there's, there's lots of self-doubt. Um, I, I don't know what it is. I think we'd have to Break that down with my therapist, to be honest. <laughs> That's part two. Yeah, part two. Other questions? Well, I'm all about the process. Um, and I'm looking at this first one past the door here. How many layers or how many times through the press does something like that take? Sure. We... A, a layer for each color or a... a, a print, you know, print for each color. How's that work? Generally, um, in a printmaking technique, it is usually a, a press run for each color. Um, there's of course exceptions like there is with everything where you can do a couple runs uh, on the same matrix, again, to use that word. Specifically in this case, um, what this started with, well, I'll just break it down since it's right here and, and you're talking about process. 
This one began this kind of red, orangish, sort of somewhat rectangular, but very organically shaped thing in the back was screen printed. It was a stencil that I was using actually for Glint Party, which is in the black frame there. If you look at those two side by side, you'll see, oh, yeah, the overall shape is the same. Well, that's, this was, um, a, I think, just a scrap piece of paper where I wanted to test the color. I wanted to see how it was on the white. Um, so that went into a drawer for a very long time. And then I pulled it out and I was like, you know, it's kind of interesting with all that negative space and just the solidity of the red. So at that point, then I started working on it some more. Um, there was only actually in this piece, Chris, a couple of press runs. So there was that red and then there was, um, actually that was the only, only quote unquote press run. Everything else was collaged and drawn specifically onto this one. So this one is, it says screen print, blah, blah, blah. It's prime, I mean, screen print might have the most real estate here, but like technical investment, it's other techniques. But if you look at a piece like um, the one immediately to your left, Chris, that is, that's a single press run, but that's a monotype. So it's basically a, a painting that was done, most of the time went into creating the image. And then the final step was just transferring it onto a piece of paper. But if you go a little further back to those two prints near the other door, those are many, many press runs. Those are more um, straight up prints. And you're talking uh, screen printing. It's very easy to build layer upon layer upon layer. So, you know, in some cases they're 10, 15 press runs. And for each press run, you have to create a different stencil, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm adding on to the image um, either by drawing onto a piece of film or or cutting into a piece of film, not to get too into the weeds with the process of printmaking, but basically for each color, I have to create a new stencil. Um, and then in, in prints like um, the lithograph there, that is also each color, I have to prepare the stone. So that one was only six colors. Um, it's a little bit more difficult to, to build layer upon layer upon layer. And also there's other technical considerations with uh, lithographic ink on ink on ink on ink you start to get rejection eventually in a way that you don't with acrylic screen printing ink so to condense that answer Chris is um, generally every color on a print is a press run and some of them are many many press runs some of them are fewer but for each press run for each color you're adding to a any sort of traditional print um, you have to edit or create an image before adding more to it. Mm -hmm. I want to ask about presentation um, because uh, the, the element of framing is a lot of artists' least favorite aspects of working as an artist. It's expensive, or if you're doing it yourself, it's time consuming. Mm -hmm. um, yours have very uh unusual we'll say novel um frames can you can you talk about um how and why you choose this presentation sure i would also add that um you know there's conversations around like whether framing is the best way of presenting art does it make it inaccessible does it make it too much of like a precious object to put it in a frame uh, I'm, I'm not i'm not sure you know mm -hmm. I, I can I can definitely listen to that argument. Uh, I learned to make my own frames way back when I was in college. Um, and I, I love working with my hands, right? I'm not, I don't just make, you know, what are primarily works on paper, but I love gardening. I like building things, usually only with right angles though. I'm not <laughs> skilled enough to like do anything too fancy. Um, but I've always enjoyed framing them too. And, now what I do is any frame I make is, is from found wood found either in, in some cases it's, it's legitimately taken from like a dumpster. Um, often, you know, people remodel older homes and like that 
baseboard trim is like perfect. It's usually three quarters of an inch wide. I can run it, make it into molding. Um, plywood, which is what I've been using most recently. Uh, I really like this element of like, you know, the part that you try to hide typically because the plies imply cheapness of material, right? But it's actually kind of beautiful, right? Those lines and the way they meet at a mitered corner. So the most recent frames I've been building are made from plywood and they're, they're pretty labor intensive. Um, you know, I don't have like a frame shop. I've got a room in my basement with some saws and it's messy as hell and it's noisy and like actually putting the work into the frames is a whole ordeal in itself too because there's dust everywhere and even though I've compressed air it's just you know it's, it's the things everyone else battles with. For me the framing has become an extension of of trying to limit the negative impact my practice has. Um, you know I'm still using acrylic in many cases or glass which is a material I have to source new which sucks um, but the wood I can pretty much entirely take from what is otherwise waste. And it's kind of a fun collecting adventure too in the warmer months to just like peek over a dumpster and see if there's anything really worthwhile in there to take away. Um, you know, frames like this aren't gonna be everyone's cup of tea. I totally understand that. Uh, where I work, the work that we frame is, is almost exclusively framed in like bright white or like whitewashed maple. And you know, that as much as possible highlights the work. It, it, it does like zero distracting away from the work which is being viewed. And I do like looking at work that way too, but you know, I'm, I'm kind of embracing this way of, of trying to make the frames about the work as well. This frame I'm really fond of um, because it's actually made from an old screen stretcher. So, you know, in screen printing, you stretch like a, a extremely fine mesh onto mostly metal now, but used to be primarily wood. And that's, that's what your screen frame is. So this was an old frame that was pretty warped, couldn't really be used anymore for printing. So I just took it and cut it down and, and made it into a frame. That's why you have, you know, the history of, of so much stuff on it, old ink, you know, it's, wa it's been waterlogged over and over. There's even, there were at the opening, I noticed a couple particles of, of the mesh still ad adhering to like the adhesive they had used. Um, but I think the frames can tell a story too. That's, that's what I tell myself anyway. <laughs> Josh, thanks so much for sharing your work with our My community. My pleasure. Thank, thanks everyone for being here. I, I really appreciate it. For, for all the uh, insightful questions. Um, I enjoyed talking about it. Awesome. I'm Jim Clark, Visual Arts Manager at Hopkins Center for the Arts. We've been speaking with Joshua Bindewald about his exhibition Muchness on view now through January 7th, 2023.